Hi, this is Jean-Francois with you again to discuss normal distributions. Today we will focus on more general cases than simply the standard normal distribution. A variable that obeys a normal distribution is identified by the label x follows n for normal distribution, mu and sigma as parameters. You've probably guessed that parameters mu and sigma will refer to the normal variables average and standard deviations, respectively. If x obeys a normal distribution of average mu and standard deviation sigma, then the following properties apply. The support for x are all real numbers. The density function for x is given by the expression shown f of x is strictly positive and symmetric around the vertical axis x equals mu. Furthermore, f has its maximum value at x equals mu. f of x has inflection points at an equal distance from mu left and right, which is given by sigma. The function will drop to zero at both extremities. And finally, the expected value of this normal distribution corresponds to its average, and its standard deviation corresponds to sigma. f of x, just like the standard normal law, has the appearance of a bell curve. The bell curve itself is influenced by the average and by the standard deviation. For example, the curves that are shown illustrate two normal distributions, both which with a standard deviation of 2, but one whose, norm, whose average value is 5 and the other's is 10. And you can tell one is just a translation of the other. In this example, the two curves share the same average value of 5. However, the blue normal distribution has a much bigger standard deviation which explains why it doesn't drop towards zero quite as fast. As for all density functions, the density function for the normal distribution can be used to find probability if area under it is obtained. In other words, the probability that x will be between a and b is obtained from the uh, definite integral where a and b are the lower and upper bounds. The integral over the entire real numbers will give one as well. As previously, we do encounter a problem because the density function that you are given cannot be anti-differentiated. And therefore, we will not be computing this integral ourselves. And therefore, what do you think we will be doing? Well, all computations will be the result of using Excel. For instance, if x has a normal distribution with 4 as the average and 9 as the standard deviation, then the probability that x will be left or equal to 8 will be given by the norm dist function from Excel or in French, loi normale. You will have to specify the value of x, as well as the expected value and the standard deviation, and mentioning that this computation is cumulative will provide you with the area that is to the left of 8. As you can tell, 67.2 is the result for this particular example. Areas between two bounds will force us to visualize how much area is left of 20 in this example, from which we want to exclude the area that is left of minus 10, leaving only the area between them. Still, this requires that we do two computations. Again, Excel will provide us with the numerical answers to both of these areas. 
in the reverse direction. Suppose we are looking for a value of a, left of which 10% of the area is located. Because we are going in a reverse direction, an inverse function will be used in the Excel components. Norm dist inverse is what we will be using, or in French, loi normale inverse. Once again, you will provide the probability corresponding to the right bound cutting off the area, as well as the normal laws expected value and standard deviation. In this case, minus 7.53 would be the cutoff point for the lower 10% of the distribution. To find the value right of which 35% of the area is observed, we will have to think backwards and figure that 65% of the area is actually located to the left of point B. Excel will do the computational part for us. Normal laws have pretty sophisticated properties, among which if we are dealing with a sum of independent variables, both of which obey normal laws, then the sum itself will also obey a normal law. The average value of this new normal law is the sum of the average values, and the variance of x plus y is the sum of the variances because of the independence aspect. This is why the standard deviation of x plus y is the root of the two variances added up together. If we apply a linear transformation to a variable that was normal, then the resulting variable will also be normally distributed. So if x is a normal variable, ax plus b will also be normally distributed. Its average value undergoes the same transformation as the original variable itself. And you recognize the property that, were that was used for standard deviations. So absolute value of a times sigma x and the, the uh, horizontal translation b has no effect on the variability. Now, in the past, conversions between general and standard normal laws were quite useful because there were no tables for every single mu and sigma. That transformation required that we take variable x, subtract mu, and divide by sigma, which made it a, a standard normal law. To recognize this, you can look at x minus mu over sigma as a linear transformation where 1 over sigma is acting as the a, and minus mu over sigma is acting as the b. According to the properties we stated earlier, then ax plus b will remain normal because x was normal in the first place. Our property, a mu x plus b, to represent the new variable's expected value, and absolute value of a times sigma x, simplify quite a bit when we consider the fact a is 1 over sigma and b is mu over sigma. Notice how the first parameter becomes 0 because of the cancelling terms and the second parameter becomes 1 because of the cancelling sigmas which are always positive. In other words, we are getting a standard normal law out of this. Now what this means is that the linear transformation becoming a standard normal law guarantees that x minus mu over sigma can be called z. If x can be turned into z by this linear transformation, then there is also a way to turn x's into z's, or z's into x's. Here's an application. Suppose that x follows a normal law with average 20 and standard deviation 6. Find the interval from a to b that is symmetric on both sides of the average, such that 90% of the probabilities are contained in this interval. In approach number 1, 
saying that P of X is between A and B equals 90% means that the probability of being left of A is 5%. It also means the probability of being left of B is 95%. And then we can use Excel to find those individual bounds. We specify that the bound left of which we wish to conserve 5% is what we are trying to obtain to get the A. And then we specify that 95% is the probability of the value left of which we're looking to find. In approach number two, we will make use of the fact that X and Z are related. If X can be obtained from a standard normal law, then having information about our normal, our standard normal law is sufficient to find bounds for X. We have seen in the previous video that Z has 90% of its area between Z5% and minus Z5%. Now, if we multiply all of the terms by 6 and add 20, because recall that our variable X had an average of, of 20, and a standard deviation of 6, then the transformation that we are bringing to the inside of the probability helps us recognize that the central term is in fact x. And therefore, a and b, symmetrically counted from 20, can act as the a and the b. According to our standard normal law, z5% is worth 1.64. And from this point, we can calculate the values for A and B individually. The end result is the exact same as in approach number one. So, to summarize, if X follows a normal law of center mu and standard deviation sigma, then the interval where we subtract z alpha over 2 multiples of, of theta, or of sigma, pardon me, or add z alpha over 2 multiples of sigma from the average value mu, then we will cut off z alpha, alpha over 2 probabilities at both extremities and leave 1 minus alpha of the area 